The 2019 season was one of the most interesting years of baseball in the history. For starters, the Juice Ball saw four teams break the previous single season home run record, the Nationals won their first title in franchise history dating back to their Expos days, and the Minnesota Twins, who were coming off the heels of a rocky 78 win season in 2018, won 101 games, the second most in franchise history. But just a couple short years later, in their first full season after their success, they went back to mediocrity, winning just 73. And if you look in terms of a 10 year window of the franchise, 2019 was a massive outlier with their next biggest total being 85. This is a story of one of the most unlikely juggernauts in recent memory. But before we dive deep into their ridiculous 2019 campaign, I want to bring you back to the 2018 season where the offense was lackluster with Miguel Sano taking a massive step back from his all-star 2017 campaign. Byron Buxton, the team's bright young star, went down early on in the season, managing to feature in just 28 games, in which he wasn't much help with a sub-200 average and 383 OPS. Also, club legends in Brian Dozier and Joe Maurer, the latter more so than the former, said goodbye to the club. In total, the offense combined for 4.6 runs per game, good for 13th best in the league, and the pitching was even worse. Their rotation, although had an intriguing young arm in Jose Barrios, wasn't anything special, lacking a true front of the line starter. And their bullpen wasn't getting the job done either, with their most used reliever holding a rough 542 ERA. In total, their pitching staff combined for a 4.5 ERA, ranking 22nd in the league, propelling the team to just a second place finish, 13 games back of the division leaders. It was obvious drastic measures had to be taken for this club to return to the playoffs. Now, heading into the offseason, they understood that, so they got started right away firing manager Paul Molitor, who had two years left on his contract. Not a shocking move as he hadn't delivered in the Twin Cities with a record of 305 and 343 over the course of his four years, as well as an 0-1 record in the postseason against none other than the New York Yankees. With a managerial role now open, the Twins decided to go for a different type of manager, one who was quote, more of a laid back type of guy, and at just 37 years old, Rocco Baldelli became the youngest manager in all of baseball. But why did they elect to go with him when there were far more qualified candidates? Well, it's simple. His understanding of advanced analytics was something the club desperately needed as they were way behind the curve in implementing it. He was just the first major piece to be put in place and the rest of the offseason was far more straightforward as they elected to fix their offensive need with the signing of veteran free agent Nelson Cruz to a one-year deal worth $14.3 million with a club option for 2020. This season was his age 38 campaign, typically when most players hang up the cleats. However, he was still well in his prime, managing 37 home runs the year prior, and in total his 203 homers between 2014 to 2018 were the most in the league during that span, 15 more than Giancarlo Stanton. And with the vacant holes left by Dozier and Maurer still needing to be addressed, they went out and got Jonathan Scope on a one-year $7.5 million deal for second. At the time, Scope had regressed mightily from his peak year in 2017, but he still maintained his great glove and managed to hit 21 homers in 2018. Moving on, first base was filled by CJ Krohn, who had 30 homers and an over 800 OPS in 2018. He was dirt cheap as well as he was claimed off waivers. Not a bad find. These were the three major offensive acquisitions they made and were poised to help a young core featuring Miguel Sano, Byron Buxton, and many more realize their potential. And as for the pitching staff, they mainly rolled out with the same crew, with the only big move signing Martin Perez who ended up starting 29 games. It was really just the same staff rolled back and improved by having guys make huge strides in their development, something that was evident in game one of the season. As mentioned, the Twins boasted one of the most intriguing young starters in the game in Jose Barrios, who posted a cumulative 3.86 ERA in his first two full seasons at the big leagues. He took the ball in the first game of the 2019 season against Cleveland, the only real competition for the Twins in the AL Central. So even though it was just game one of 162, these are the types of games that come back to haunt a club at the end of September. And after managing just a 9-10 record against Cleveland in 2018, they started off 2019 on the right foot, as mentioned by strong pitching performances. Jose Barrios tossed 7 and 2 thirds scoreless innings and 10 Ks, with Taylor Rogers, who was thrusted into the closing role in the offseason, taking the final inning in the third to close out the game 2 to nothing. It wasn't an offensive showcase unlike most of the Twins games that season, or well MLB games for that matter. 
but this game showed that the pitching staff led by Jose Brios would be more than capable of helping the club win tight contests, and their opening day victory set the tone early on as the team enjoyed a 38-18 record by the end of May, the best in all of baseball. They achieved this success through their new offense that steamrolled opposition pitching staffs, and in an interview following an 8-1 victory over division rival Chicago White Sox, Eddie Rosario had this to say in his post-game interview. When, you, when you're hitting a lot of bomba, everybody hitting bombas, everybody's happy. <laughs> this was when the Twins' offensive sluggers were officially coined as the Bomba Squad, because, well, they were mashing home runs left and right. And by the end of May, they already had 106 long balls, the most in the league at that time, and were on pace for 306 by the end of the season, which would completely blow past the previous record the Yankees had set the year prior at 267. It was a nice change of pace for the Twins franchise as a whole, as they previously been labeled as an offensive team that liked to nibble away at the opposition pitching staffs rather than try to overpower them. But not anymore. The new signings were performing well, with Scope hitting 10 homers in his first 50 games, with an OPS topping 800. CJ Crone had 13 homers during this time, with an OPS at 866. And Nelson Cruz, well, he had been performing with 7 homers and an 862 OPS in his first 35 games, but he went on the injured list because of his wrist, taking him out until June. Cruz wasn't the only one the club had been missing, as Miguel Sano also spent time on the injured list due to a heel injury. It wasn't until July when this offense was full power, which coincidentally was their best month in terms of home runs per game, averaging a little over two throughout their 24 matchups. They did this with eight guys managing at least three or more, and five with at least five. However, record-wise, July was the club's worst month of the season and allowed Cleveland, who were 10 and a half games back at the end of May, to come within three and a half on September 14th. And with a doubleheader schedule between the two, the Twins could either extend their lead to five and a half or let it dwindle down to within two. Game one of this contest felt eerily similar to opening day with the final score ending two to nothing, backed by strong pitching performances once again from a plethora of relievers for the Twins, including deadline acquisition Sergio Romo and Taylor Rogers, who recorded his 26th save of the season. Game two, however, was far more interesting. In the top of the eighth inning, with Cleveland winning five to four, the Twins had the front of their lineup to look forward to, and Jonathan Scope got it started with a single into left field off Oliver Perez, bringing up Max Kepler who grounded into a force out at second base, but following an errant throw to first, he was able to move up 90 feet, putting him in prime position to score, and with Jorge Polanco's double into deep left field, he was able to jog home comfortably to tie the game, bringing the Twins' win probability up to 54, a figure that had been as low as 11 during the sixth inning. And now with a man in scoring position with just one out, they looked to take the lead, and with the ever-dangerous Nelson Cruz up at the plate, he was intentionally walked to face Eddie Rosario, who was practically walked intentionally again as he loaded the bases on four straight balls. So up came Miguel Sano. As mentioned, he missed the first month and a half of action and was coming off a disappointing 2018 campaign, which saw him hit just 199 with a 679 OPS in 71 games. But 2019 was different. Up until this point in the season, he had 27 home runs with an OPS over 200 points higher at 885. And on the very first pitch of his battle with Nick Goody, this happened. First one out. A drive to left field and deep. A grand slam for Miguel Sano. <laughs> This was the dagger in Cleveland season as they fell five and a half games behind with just 14 left. And with the Twins' magic number down to one following a complete team performance over the Detroit Tigers on September 25th, they watched in the visitors' clubhouse as the White Sox handed Cleveland an 8-3 loss to clinch the division. 2019 had everything for Twins fans. A 100-win season for just the second time in franchise history, a division crown for the first time since 2010, and to make sure the season didn't feel too much like a dream, they got swept in the ALDS by the New York Yankees. But in all seriousness, this team was electric all season long, and the offense was the most powerful in baseball during one of the most offensive heavy years in league history. This provided extreme excitement for everyone watching, in particular from five guys who were labeled as the leaders of the Bomba Squad. The first being Mitch Garver, a catcher who had the bat of a first baseman slugging 31 homers, knocking in 61, and had an OPS just 5 points shy of 1,000. For reference, his OPS number was by far the highest among catchers, with at least 350 plate appearances, beating out Wilson Contreras by 107 points. And in terms of WRC+, his 155 mark was 29 points higher than second place. That's about the same difference as second place and 14th place Jorge Alfaro. Moving on, the second guy was Miguel Sano. Remember when I mentioned he had a late start only making his season debut in mid-May? Well, that didn't stop him from clubbing 34 homers and knocking in 79 with an OPS of 923, all of which were career bests and he only played in 105 games. Next up, Eddie Rosario. 
The man who brought the name Bomba Squad to life earlier in the season was on fire all year long, managing to hit 32 of his own while leading his team with 109 RBIs. That figure was also the second most among qualified left fielders, sandwiched between Juan Soto and Ronald Acuna Jr. Yeah, not bad company to be alongside. Now the penultimate of the five, Max Kepler. He had been around the club for a few years, but seemed to have stalled in his development, stagnating around 20 home runs with an OPS in the mid to low 700s. But like a lot of young twin sluggers, he improved massively under the new coaching staff and set career highs in home runs with 36, RBIs with 90, and OPS at 855. And finally, perhaps the biggest slugger on the team, Nelson Cruz. Coming into the season, there were some question marks regarding his durability, and while he did go on the injury list twice during the regular season, he muscled through and was one of the most feared hitters in the league at 38 years old, smashing 41 long balls, knocking in 108, and was just one of six players to hold an OPS above 1,000. He also had a WRC Plus of 164, which only trailed Mike Trout, Christian Yelich, and Alex Bregman. But perhaps the craziest stat of all, he hit for average with a 311 figure, not something many powerful DHs do. In total, all five of these guys slugged at least 30 home runs. No team in MLB history had more than four players reach that figure in a single season. They also had eight players slug at least 20, and if Byron Buxton didn't miss so much time, they probably would have fielded a full lineup which is ridiculous because that team did not need any more power. They actually finished the year with the most home runs in MLB history, beating out the Yankees, Astros, and Dodgers, smashing the previous record by a whopping 40 long balls. They seem to get help everywhere from this group, including the bench. Jason Castro, a name I'm sure you haven't heard in quite some time, managed to hit 13 in his 79 games. Utility man Marwin Gonzalez hit 15 himself in 115, and outfielder Jake Cave saw a lot of playing time with Buxton down, and he also put together solid performances, ending his season with 8 homers and an OPS above 800 in his 72 games. To sum up, this offense raked. They had slugger after slugger in each position, as the team saw their runs per game soar from 13th best at 4.6 a game to 1.2 runs better at 5.8, just missing out as the highest in baseball. Nonetheless, 5.8 is extremely elite and gave the pitching staff a little more wiggle room on the mound even though they genuinely didn't need it. It was no secret pitching was a major talking point entering the season because there wasn't much that changed from 2018. They added a couple guys like Martin Perez who ate up innings but wasn't necessarily effective with a 5.12 ERA and a few relievers like Mike Morin who didn't even finish the year with the squad. But they finished the season with a team ERA of 4.18, good for 9th best in the league a massive improvement from the year prior when they ranked 22nd at 4.5. Nothing crazy out of this world, but to improve from 22nd place, that's a difference you can tell on a game-to-game -game basis, and it was especially evident in the bullpen. Taylor Rogers, who had enjoyed stellar campaigns in his first few years in the league, made a smooth transition to be the closer and converting 30 of his 36 save opportunities. Everyone's favorite Trevor May had the best season of his career with a sub-3 ERA, and Tyler Duffy, who had an ugly 720 figure the year prior, enjoyed immense success as he lowered that figure down to just 2.5 in 58 appearances. The Twins also had other quality relievers in 2019, but these were the three who the club relied on the most and in tight games, something they found themselves in quite often, totaling 35 one-run contests in which they won 23 for a winning percentage of 657. In non-one-run games, they had a winning percentage of 617, showing that when games got close, this bullpen was able to prevail. And during these outings, they were well-rested thanks to a rotation that ate up a lot of innings. Jose Brios, their number one top 200 for the first time in his career, and did so with his lowest ERA at 368. And the rest of the rotation featured guys who had been around the league for a while, and in total the staff boasted three arms with a 401 ERA or below. That may not sound great, but for 2019 in the year of the home run, that's pretty solid. This group of Gideon Minnesota, one of the greatest regular seasons in franchise history. As mentioned, just missing the record for wins by one to the 1965 squad that made it to the World Series. And while the 2019 team did not make it that far losing to the New York Yankees, it just had to be the Yankees. I'm, I'm sorry, Twins fans. But anyways, with the majority of their lineup coming back for the next few seasons, it wouldn't be crazy to think this core group of guys would continue to find, at the very least, regular season success. But in the next full season, the club returned to their regular ways of mediocrity with a 73-89 and record, which is why it was so odd for that one year, they were in the same boat record-wise as some of the most prestigious franchises in the league, a company this franchise has not been surrounded by for quite some time. 
That wraps it up for this video. Let me know what you think about the 2019 twins in the comments. And if you enjoyed, consider leaving a like to help the channel reach more like-minded people and subscribing to stay up to date with all the great baseball content I've in store each week. Also, I got this video idea from Jolly Olive. If you want to check out his video, there's a link in the description. Alright, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.